Well gang, we've made it to New Orleans in one piece. And we are going to start our mission today at a very famous cemetery. Many of you probably know it just for all the cool monuments and graves here. And that would be the one and only Metairie Cemetery. And we are in. Well, we finally made it here. It's February 28th, midday, and I'll tell you what, as a first stop, this is an amazing place. I gotta tell you, this, this cemetery blows anything away, even in Chicago. The Rose Hills, and the, well, Graceland would probably be pretty close, but this cemetery is massive also. I'm overwhelmed. We're gonna just start walking. I mean, just right here, you could just, you could spend, I am not going to be able to hit, I'm not even going to be able to scratch the surface of hitting the cemetery today and try to keep this around a half hour, probably be 45 minutes, but come on along, let's, uh, let's check it out. The first thing that caught my eye was this big monument, of course. This monument is dedicated to the Army of Northern Virginia, Louisiana Division. It is a striking. Quite a dramatic statue. That's talent, those sculptors. Let's go over and check that one out. Wow. Just amazing. It goes on and on. Goes back pretty far. Look at the beautiful stained glass here. Holy cow. Just amazing. Two beautiful statues here. David N. McCann. There are six crypts, and it appears that only one of them has an inscription up here at the top. And that would be a Kate M. McCann Greenlaw. Oh, we can go in. The door's open. Okay. Not that we need to go in too far, but... February 25th, 1882, and she died in February 14th, 1919. Take a look at this same glass. Wow. Interesting floor pattern. Some flowers. It says, I will both lay me down in peace and sleep. This one is Nolan Marioni. Quite grand. Another beautiful stained glass worth taking a look at. This one is closed. Ah, we don't need to go in there. William Thomas Nolan on top. A Dr. Federico. Girolamo, Girolamo Ulissi Marinani. So, there's a lot of people in here. I'll let you read it. Anna Laplace. 
Can't read the dates if there is a date. Oh, look at that. Stained glass, wonderful. Ooh, look at this anthill. Interesting. You locals will laugh at me. You'll say, what's the big deal? Never seen one like that before. <laughs> There are a couple of very interesting ones here. Christina Maitre, 1830 to 1898, and some others. Boy, look at this one. Amazing. I don't see any names on this one. Well, this is definitely a famous one, the Brunswick. I know a little about this one. Look at that. The Sphinx, the Lady. Well, I'll step back a little to get a good view of this. This was modeled after a tomb in Milano, Italy. And the marble sphinx and the female figure with the libation urn are just stunning sculptures. Let's take a close look. They're massive. They're kind of intimidating, especially the sphinx. It's probably 1.5 human scale, if I were to guess, maybe two times, no, two times, no. Well, it's bigger, I'll show you my hand, give you a feel. It's much bigger than human scale. And there, therein makes it look spooky. Here is the, the woman. Look how well this marble has endured. These are priceless relics, I'll tell you. Priceless.
interesting monument that I had been looking for for a little while, finally found. It is a rather unique design in that of a ruined castle. Probably reminding us of ruined lives, dead, death. I'm just guessing. Look at that. That is amazing. This is the Egan family tomb. The ruined castle. It looks like it's of Gothic design, certainly. I understand it's modeled after the ruins of a chapel on a family estate in Ireland. Very, very nice. Let's see what the inscription says. Even at the top there, you can see it's very carefully, very well done. There's four steps here. Oh, the top step is a ground epitaph with a lot of names on it. Almost impossible to read. Well, for the camera, I, if I laid down here and I could do it. I can recognize the name Egan, and that's in memory of who died December 27th, 1881. And his brothers, and all his brothers are listed. Amazing. Let's keep looking. We are on the southeastern corner of the cemetery now, right by the expressway. It's very loud, so I'm going to have to yell a little bit. But there are some, at least two, maybe three famous graves, I think three here, I, I want to take a look at. And of course, this is the grave of General Beauregard, a Civil War Confederate general. It is built in an earthen mound. It's an open mausoleum. An amazing statue of a Civil War horseman. In the battle pose. General Beauregard was quite an amazing general. He actually was the first Confederate general officer appointed by a Brigadier General in the Provisional Army of the Confederate States. And that was on March 1st, 1861. And he was later, of course, promoted to general in the Confederate Army, one of only seven appointed to that rank. He was a Confederate general who actually started the Civil War by ordering the firing of the first shots at Fort Sumter. And he did so from nearby Fort Johnson. That bombardment lasted for 34 hours. And after it reached that point, from the batteries ringing from the harbor, Anderson, who was in charge there, he surrendered the fort. He finally gave up. And that was on April 14th. And that really, that started the Civil War very important figure here to remember, good or bad. There's a Confederate soldier here. Looks like it's carved in marble on a granite base. I'm not going to be able to get that close. 
but I'll try to reach over with my contraption here. It's a very dramatic backdrop with the horse in the background, the mounted soldier. Beautiful piece of art. It says here that this is the Army of Tennessee. There's a the brickwork here indicates that and this is his tomb. It looks like there's several crypts in here. Uh, this plaque here says organized by the Surveying Louisiana Soldiers, Army of Tennessee at New Orleans, April 6, 1877. Now, as I look, there's no way to read. They're in a dark, very dark color. Uh, there's a lot of people here, it appears. So there's really not much to see. This monument here, this tall monument, was made for Daniel Moriarty. And they say it's the, the tallest privately owned monument in the country. Now there's four statues. And they say that the three, three of the statues stand for the three virtues, which is faith, hope, and charity. And the fourth statue supposedly stands for memory. And that one is the one that's carrying the symbolic wreath, which would be this one on the left here. Let's go over and take a look at the statue. There is a inscription on there that I see for Daniel. Well, it just says when he died. He died June 4th, 1924. Here across from Beauregard on the south side is the marker and monument to Lacoste family. Eugene Lacoste was a famous hairdresser here way back in the old days. And he made a fortune in the stock market. And they lived pretty good. Look at this monument. It's, it's incredible, it's all marble. You can see from here. And there's a sarcophagus up there, and I'm guessing that's just a sculpture. Amazing, look at this. What craftsmanship. Even the stairs are marble. He was born in France, and he died here in New Orleans, March 28th. 1915. Jean was born in France also in August of 1833 and she died here a year after or so in 1916. Wow, this is stunning. I'll tell you, they gave their fortune, most of it, to charities here namely the Charity Hospital. And a sad footnote to that is that after Hurricane Katrina hit, uh, the mayor, the governor, whoever, they decided to not reopen it as a teaching hospital with a great legacy. So it's gone, it's maybe abandoned now, torn down, I don't know. They also gave money to the Delgado Museum here and maybe other charities, so a very interesting story. Well, next 
I want to look for a grave of a character that was here, and he went by the name of No Smile Harrington. So let's go look for his tomb. ahead is the crypt of Beauregard's daughter. This is architecturally reminiscent of Islamic architecture. Quite interesting. Laura Beauregard Larendon is here. Somebody left some flowers. Laura T. Beauregard, wife of Charles A. Larendon, 1850 to 1884. She passed in 84. Wow. It says Charles A. Larendon passed in 1918. Wow, many years later. He was born 10 years before her, too, so she. she and he had a lot of years together, but he lived to be, uh, well, let's see, 60, 78, and she lived to be 34 only, wow. Well, some good history there to, uh, to read up on. Well, I'm still looking for no smile. We're going to find him. For those of you that are from New Orleans, you already know what I'm going to explain. And for those of you that know about New Orleans cemeteries, you'll also know. But these are what's called wall vaults. There are association wall vaults, and then we're going to look over here, there are family wall vaults. And the unique thing about this here is that the people that are buried in these vaults, well at least the association ones, and many of the family ones, the body is only in there for a year and a day. And let me explain. Number one, we have 100% humidity. My lens is barely staying unfogged. A couple of feet below me is the water table, and when it rains in the rainy season, it's flooding. You cannot bury the bodies in the ground. They learned that in the 1700s or so, as the coffins would come up and float down Main Street in New Orleans. Not a good thing. So everybody in New Orleans is pretty much buried in a lot of these parts above ground. That's why you see this proliferation of crypts and mausoleums, which is really cool. So what they do is they put the body, and there's an open one. I haven't gone up there to look. It looks, it looks empty. They'll put the body in a coffin in there for one year and one day. And with the summer heat, 100 degrees plus, Summer humidity, 100% plus. Large roaches, lots of worms, but the cockroaches and all the heat, and it turns into, these all turn into ovens, and I'm not exaggerating. And they cook the corpse, and within a year, you're pretty much reduced to mostly bones. So what they do is they take the bones, they put them in a, well, they used to put them in like a burlap sack, I think today they put them in plastic, and they will shove it to the back of the crypt and then they'll put the next body in. 
or they'll take it away and put it somewhere. And, or in some cases, in these family crypts, and I don't know which ones, and I don't know if it's here, they have a slot in the back on the, uh, you know, in the back on the bottom. Maybe there will be one here, and they just shove all the the remains down, and it goes down all the way to the bottom somewhere, and family member after family member just piles up. So you are be, you're going to be commingling with your family in that case. So anyway, let's take a look here. This looks like a association. This is an Italian association. Let's take a look and see what we've got here. The fog has moved in and I can barely keep the lens from fogging up. I hope it works out. So let's take a look in here. Now I've got this camera on an extended st uh, stabilizer leveler that's almost two feet long so I can get way in there. Now there's, it looks like there's no slot in the back. Looks pretty simple. But I'll try to reach in there. Not that there's a lot to see. So that's what it looks like. There is a marble vault here, cover, just like the other ones, and it's laid down for the next resident. Here is one that just has a caulked, looks like a drywall latex cover. This is silicone sealant. Oh, that is, that's moving. You could just, you could just uh, blow on that. It's going to fall out. I'm sure there's a coffin in there. I look to my left and I see inscriptions for the association. Now, you, what's interesting is the first one is Vincenzo Campanella, 1874 to 1927. And you read the death dates, I see as they go down, it stops in 1940. You know what that tells me? That tells me they started getting a lot of residents here and they just stopped keeping count because at some point they probably took Vincenzo and Antonio and Natalie out or Natalia out and started doing this routine that we're talking about in the 1940s and 50s so very interesting so let's back out of here and across the way here we have a number of family crypts. Here, here you see down the line more associations. A lot of these are Italian. And here we have family wall vaults. This is another association it looks like. And they all say W-O-W. What does that mean, guys? I know. Not just one, a lot of you know what that means, and you can share that in comments for us. Here are, I'm guessing these are the family wall vaults. Here's one from 1941. It looks like they came back and, oh, look at this. Here's what I'm talking about. Here's the, the family. Now, because there are others below, I don't think they have a slot, but you can see this, is, this has been shared by many uh, family members and others looking at the last names and looking at this one. That's all the same family. So that's what I'm talking about, guys. See? There are some that are just one person, permanent resident, I'm guessing. Or they, you know, in this case, there's three bodies or three deaths, maybe they are all in there. I'm guessing they are in there, pushed to the back, exactly as I was saying, of course. Well, all of these with the multiple names, where else are they gonna put them? I don't know, maybe you guys know. But they're all, many of them, most of them have multiple names. So very interesting. The architecture is just unbelievable. Look at that. That is just that statue up there.
Here ahead is another interesting tomb. It is of a local madame, J.A. Morales. She was, uh, I think her name was Josie, yes, Josie Arlington. And I don't see her name here. I see a Catherine Morales, a Rita, but I was doing some research on this and it was stated that the name was Josie Arlington and she was a famous madame here, infamous from Storyville. And they say her ghost haunts this site. So don't come here at night. So we got Catherine and Rita. Captain Jose, U.S. Marines. And this has some money here. Look at this statue. Is this haunting or what? She is holding her hand mysteriously in front of the door. Almost like, don't come out. Please don't come out. That's what it, I don't know, that's what it says to me. Very interesting. Here's a inscription from the sculptor. 1911, I think it says. Very, very haunting, very haunting deal here. Wow. It looks like, I don't know, Lord of the Rings, those doors. Like you're going to enter those doors and go through the gates. It is very haunting. Uh, God rest the souls of these families here, if it is the Arlingtons and the Morales's, it's quite an intriguing tomb. Interesting statue. This is a magnificent mausoleum here. Some beautiful glass. Look at that blue, reminiscent of the Schwepp family. The sheds. You seen that video? That is striking. You could spend, like I said, you could, you could spend days here and not even scratch the surface. Well, look who we have here. I think that is no smile. I think that's him, guys. The telltale woman. Yeah, it's got to be him. Let's go have a look. Now, No Smile Harrington was a big gambler here back in the day. You think he was from Ireland? And the story on him was he did pretty well, but of course, as his name indicates, he would never smile. So here's a little background on Jay Harrington, Joseph. Well, he was a pretty well-known gambler here in New Orleans who plied his trade on the 100 block of Royal Street 
back in the early 1900s. People were very wary of him. He wouldn't smile. And of course, he could look at his hand without looking at it. They said he'd never look down. They would always wonder, how did he know what he had? It's a very mysterious individual. And it was interesting that he, after this good night, he got in his car and he drove home and the next morning he wasn't found. He never came home. So when they finally found him, they found him in his car wrapped around a utility pole and he was shot and killed. So you wonder, was it the losers of the game? Was it a debt he owed? Or did people just not like him? They were, they were sick of him. Maybe they thought he was cheating. No one will ever know. But I think what's most interesting is that this, this tomb was provided for by his wife. Of course, he left her a fortune. And her name was Bertha. And I see she died in 1956. She lived, she lived a long time. And the judge handling this succession refused to approve the expense for this tomb. He was saying it was not commensurate with the size of the estate. And of course, this estate was all in cash, hidden underground somewhere you know, in coins and gold. I mean, the gamblers were not paying taxes and reporting their income. But that did not stop his wife, Bertha, from building this tomb. She did it, and she used the assets that nobody knew about, and she just got it done. So hats off to Bertha. Judge never found out about it. Well, rest in peace, Bertha and Joseph. And that's going to wrap it up from Materi. Sorry, guys, I could spend I could spend here all day. I, I like I said, I just probably scratched the the surface, the tip of the iceberg. Maybe we'll come back before I leave, or someday, definitely. But this this is an amazing place. All right, I'm pumping them out day by day. Probably putting out two or three a week for you. So let's. Uh, Let's keep, let's carry on with the trip. This is fun.